Good morning, brethren. Good morning, that was beautiful. I love it. I love the sound of children. And I'm sure God loves the sound of us be our His children. Before I get started, I'd like to let you all know that my wife is in Alaska and she says if I do not tell you all hello and greetings, I will be in very big trouble. So I know this is being videoed somehow and she will find out if I didn't do it. So my wife Joanne in Alaska wishes you all happy Sabbath and a happy feast. It was a very emotional day. That day many, many for children to be even more many years ago. My parents had been in the hospital with our family waiting, waiting there since the day before. I was to be the first born boy of the family. I have one girl cousin that is two years older. My grandparents' 25th wedding anniversary party was scheduled on the day my mother went into labor. However, my mother says it is time and they went to the hospital. But 24 hours later, I was born. Hug and kisses all around. The family was ecstatic. They were all worn out, so very tired, especially my mother. What a wonderful day. July 23rd in Corpus Christi, Texas. I had been born with a little jaundice. My skin was yellow. So I had to stay under a lamp for 24 hours before I was able to go home. Are you a parent? A grandparent? Do you remember the first time you saw your brand new infant's face? Those little hands, those tiny little toes, those chubby cheeks? Oh, those cheeks. Remember the fresh, brand new baby smell? What a wonderful bunch of memories I have when I first got to meet my son, who is 22 now and much taller than I. My parents had big dreams for me. Perhaps I would grow up to follow my father's footsteps and be in law enforcement. Perhaps I would even be our family's first doctor. I would try to give, uh, they tried to give me the best of everything that they could provide. In my parents' eyes, I had such amazing potential and, until that one day, that one day that happened to almost everyone in here, you became a know-it-all teenager. Snotty, surly, and sure that you could do it your own way. Do you all remember that, or am I the only one that was that way? I heard some giggles, so I'm going to assume that some other people were that way at one time. Every time my mom or dad would try to correct me or tell me how something would eventually turn out if I continued down that path that I was going, I would think to myself, man, my mom or my dad is so dumb. I look back on those times and cringe and think my son most of the thought of that when I talk to him at least once or twice. God has been very merciful to me and let me live to the age of 25 when something something suddenly changed. I grew up. Then all of a sudden, my father wasn't so dumb after all. As I pass into maturity, I can see back in my life how foolish I was. How foolish I was to argue with my parents, who only wanted the best for me. Especially my poor father. I apologize to him profusely every day. Sometimes twice a day. The title of this message is The Wisdom of Dad. The Wisdom of Dad. I, along with every single one of you, were younger ones. When you were younger, and some of them are still young, a parent, a grandparent, a coach, or a teacher, the list can go on and on, most likely gave you advice to help you in your formative years. What I'm calling formative years is 0 to 25 for men and 0 to 20 for women. Because face it, women mature much faster than men. It took every bit of 25 years for me to grow up. And yes, I'm still growing up. I was a very difficult child because I knew everything. I didn't need my parents to tell me 
how to do most things because somehow I was born with the innate ability to do it right the first time. Well, not exactly. Actually, I was truly inept. I had no idea how to do anything, but yet I still thought I was special. My parents had to coerce me a few times. I'm sure that's an international symbol for coercion. They tried to set me on the straight and narrow path. Frankly, I was pitiful and needed lots of correction. I thought I was different. I thought natural law did not apply to me because after all, I was special. God, much like my dad, has given us all instructions, advice, and even mild coercion to help us grow into productive heirs in God's family. I would like for us to turn into our Bibles to Genesis 1, the very beginning. And I will be reading to you from Genesis 1. Excuse me, I will be reading for you from the New King James Version. Okay. We see God's instruction from the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis 1, and we'll start in verse 7. Verse 7. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, and he created him. Male and female, he created them. Whoa, apparently I am on the wrong verse. Just one second. That was verse 27. Pardon me. Let's try that again. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, verse 28 in Genesis 1, Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is in the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be food. Verse 30. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. We can see that God was very happy with mankind at the beginning, as much parents are with their newborn. God laid out rules for us to obey, not out of meanness, but out of concern. How quickly did it start to unravel? Not because God did something wrong, because we thought we knew it all. God laid out rules for Adam and Eve, and at the very beginning, you all can have everything here on earth, he said, except that one tree, the tree of good and evil. But mankind was sure that they knew what was best for themselves, even though God had warned them gently and lovingly. Soon after the first two kids were born on earth, Cain chose his own path, that away from what God instructed and revolted against his brother Abel and killed him without remorse for his actions. How incredibly sad that our daddy, the Lord Eternal, must have felt seeing the atrocities that his children were doing. Can you put yourself in God's shoes? How would you feel? How would you react if your children, your most cherished children, were to attack each other and do these great sins? I'm sure you would be devastated. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 5.29. I'm sorry I did not pronounce it correctly. Forgive me. In fact, if there's anything that you don't understand, write it down and I'll explain it later. Deuteronomy 5, verse 29. God wants us to be very happy. And He wants us to live well. He knows our hearts and minds. We see in Deuteronomy 5, 29, he says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, and that it might be well with them and with their children forever. The word here in the New King James Version, fear, has always bothered me. 
So I looked up to see what it meant. According to Strong's concordance, which is the number H3372, Strong's H3372, fear is pronounced yari, to fear, to morally, to revere, or to be in reverence. That's how I believe it is intended. We are to revere, we are to respect, we are to honor the high Lord Creator that we have, our Father. Young people, adults, were we ever stiff-necked as the Bible describes the Israelites to our parents or to any adult who gives us instruction? Did we ever argue with them about how we knew better and how we are different? Or better yet to say, this always made my father especially angry. You don't know me. So to infer that their advice did not really apply to us. Have we been able to look back and see how foolish we were and gone back and tried to change for the better? After 25 years of eating crow, I have apologized and will continue to do so, not only to my father, my mother, and all my family. We know, or should know, the Ten Commandments, and should from time to time reread Exodus 20, 1 through 17, and Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 21. These rules or guidelines that God, our Father, is laid out for us to keep in mind as we grow. As we grow and mature, we see that He intends us not only to know His laws, but to fully understand why He made those laws. We see their deeper meanings revealed to us by Jesus in the New Testament. We find out through the action of keeping the commandments that it's not only what we do, but it's how we think when we do them. How you think is more important to God than actually just keeping the commandments. And yes, you must keep the commandments. Turn with me to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus say the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusted man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart deep parts from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in the salt land which is not inhabited. Verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spread out its roots by the river, and will not fear when he comes. But its leaves will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Blessed is the man who trusts the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. God shows us His way is a better way. Isaiah 55, 8-9, and I'll just read it for you. You don't have to change, uh, turn there. Isaiah 55, verse 8-9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our Father, our Daddy, cares so much for not us to fool ourselves into thinking we don't need instructions to have a good and happy life. He also planned for each one of us to become part of His family and teach others as how God's way is the right way to live. Just like the sermon end, we need to learn how to train and then to teach others. God has promised us many things that we adhere to to his instructions and live the way that he wants us to live. So I have a few points. Number one, he, our Father, has promised to supply everything we need. Let us turn to a well-known passage in Matthew 6 and start in verse 25. Verse 25 in Matthew 6. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is not 
life more than food and more body than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither soar nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valued than they? Most assuredly you are. Isn't that wonderful? Surely you have not seen too many starving birds as you drive by or walk around town. <clears throat> Which of you worry? That's in verse 27. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? I am probably the shortest man in my congregation, and I have come here to find out I'm still short. <laughs> but how much would me worrying about it help me grow taller? Now of God, verse 30, close the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Verse 32, For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows what you need of these things. But first seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Our most loving Father, Dad, promises to take care of us if we do as He asks. Not worrying about these things help us to concentrate on bigger and better things. The learning of His way and learning to think as He does. Not to lean on our own understanding. On your own time, I ask you to read Proverbs 3. <clears throat> In my Bible, it is labeled, Guidance for the Young. That was Proverbs 3. As pointed out in many places in the Bible, we are required to do things ourselves, not just sit there waiting to be served by God. There is a common saying that goes like this. Surely God gives every bird its food, but He doesn't throw it in the nest. Ponder that. Surely God gives every bird its food, but He doesn't throw it in the nest. The birds of the air do go out and scratch around to find their food. They do toil to eat. Turn with me for, to 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3. And we will start in verse 8. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 8. And we will read to verse 13. Verse 8. Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not burden, might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but because, but, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we command you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. One more scripture on how God expects us not to be idle. You don't have to turn there, I will read it for you. The scripture is Proverbs 12, verse 11. Proverbs 12, verse 11. He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread, but he who follows frivolity is devoid of understanding. So you see, God requires us to use proper judgment on how we eat and drink as well. The book of Proverbs is full of excellent advice on how to live. One more I'll read to you. Proverbs 23, verse 21. Proverbs 23, verse 21. It shows us, For the drunkard and the glut will come to poverty, and drowsiness will close a man with rags. If we are seeking God and doing His will as the Bible instructs, God will take care of us, and we do not need to worry about physical things. My second point. He has promised that His children will not be overtaken with temptation. Instead, He assures us that a way of escape will be provided. 
He has promised that His children will not be overtaken with temptation. Instead, He assures us that there, there will be a way of escape will be provided. I would like for us to turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. <clears throat> and we will start in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, this is 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses and in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank from the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Verse 6. Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted, and not to become idolaters as some of them were. As, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Verse 8. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, or in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also were tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Now frankly, I'm very afraid of serpents. I don't like them at all. And I would probably die just seeing one much less being bit by one. Verse 10. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, as they were written for our admonition, our instruction, this is help from our Father, so we can see upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands Take heed, lest ye fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with temptation will also make a way of escape, that you may be also able to bear it. When I first came into the faith, I was very weak. As through trials and tribulations, I have become stronger, and so have the trials and the temptations. But as God has said, He will give you a way of escape. There's always a way out. God will always give us a way, but understand that we should do our very best to stay out of harm's way. Do not go to dangerous places. Do not do per perilous things because you think you can handle it. Or just to see if God really will get you out of it. You need to be wise in your actions and follow His precepts to the best of your ability. We spend time on earth to hone our heart to what God wants it to be. As stated in verse 6, we have the Bible to see for examples. We don't need to make those same mistakes. I often tell my son when I'm explaining something that I've done in the past, that I have already experienced the pain. No reason for you to go through it again. He would say, and he doesn't say it very often, he's a much better child than I was. He would say, well, you did it. Why can't I? <laughs> but I'm warning you, and the Bible also warns you, to avoid those pitfalls and pains. We have examples, many examples in the Bible, on how not to make those same mistakes and to avoid those pains. My next point. <clears throat> he has promised that all things work together for good to those who love and serve Him faithfully. He has promised that all things work together for good to those who love and serve Him faithfully. That scripture is from Romans 8, 28. I'd like to spend a little bit more time on this example. And one very good example is that of Joseph, son of Jacob. Joseph's account is found in Genesis 37. These are the chapters. 
Genesis 37 through 50. The, I had given this before and somebody said, I couldn't find verse 50. And I said, no, no, no. Chapters 37 through chapters 50 is what I mean. We are not going to read the story in full, but I will mention the scriptures if you want to jot it down and recount those different parts of the story. Jacob's favoritism towards Joseph most assuredly led to his older brothers to resent him to the point of hatred. We should see that as an example as well, not to show favoritism. The final straw that sent the brothers over the edge was when Jacob presented Joseph with a highly decorated coat. Joseph was hated and resented by his brothers even more. To make matters worse, and I can see myself doing this, Joseph had a dream and had to tell everyone about it. He told everyone, you all will fall to me one day. This infuriated the brothers and they wanted to kill him in the wilderness. Reuben, his eldest brother, objected to outright murder. So instead, the brothers chose to sell Joseph as a slave. The brothers then sell Joseph and deceived their father into thinking that their favorite son had been killed and torn apart by wild beasts. You can find that in Genesis 37, verses 18 to 35. Joseph is so to a high-ranking Egyptian named Potiphar and eventually becomes the supervisor of Potiphar's household. In chapter Genesis, excuse me, in chapter 39 in Genesis, we read of how Joseph excelled as his duties and became one of Potiphar's most trusted servants and was even put in charge of his entire household. Can you believe that? This is a slave, Joseph, became more trusted above everyone else, even his own countrymen. Potiphar could see that whatever Joseph did, whatever he touched, God looked favorably on him and had him running things actually helped Potiphar prosper. Potiphar's wife, however, attempted to seduce Joseph, and when her advances were not reciprocated, he said no. She falsely accused him of attempted rape. We see that in Genesis 39, 7 through 20 verses 7 through 20. Although Joseph was completely innocent of this matter, he was cast into prison. I believe because Potiphar viewed him so favorably, he was not executed. Because I believe if your family was dishonored in such a way, he probably would have been executed. But because he loved Joseph, because God showed favor on him, not that he didn't believe his wife, but because he loved Joseph so much that he put him into prison and said, so to sum up, Joseph is grabbed by his brothers at the age of 17, approximately, sold into slavery, sold again to Potiphar, and then named number one in all the household, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and then thrown into jail. That is a lot to take in. Still, Joseph kept his eyes on God and chose to follow him no matter what. While in jail, Joseph interprets the dream of two of his fellow prisoners. Both interpretations prove to be accurate and true. And one of the men is later released from jail and restored to his position as the king's cupbearer. We saw that in Genesis 40, verses 1 to 23. Joseph tells the cupbearer that when he gets a chance to speak to the king, please tell him I was wrongly in prison and I would really like to get out of jail. I mean, wouldn't you? The cupbearer, all excited about being released, totally forgets about Joseph for two years. Can you imagine? Well, I think I would probably be like the cupbearer, excited and totally forget everybody except yourself. That is human nature. But Joseph showed God nature. Two years later, the king had some troubling dreams and asked people to interpret the meaning. The cupbearer finally remembers Joseph and asks him for help. Joseph interprets the dreams to mean that they foretell seven years of bountiful harvest by seven years, excuse me, followed by seven years of severe famine in Egypt. <clears throat> he then advised the king to begin storing up grain in preparation for the coming dearth or uh, famine. 
Grateful for his wisdom, Joseph is made the ruler in Egypt, second only to the kings. We see that in Genesis 41, verses 38 through 49. So about 22 years have passed since the brothers sold Joseph to the slave traders. Joseph now spoke Egyptian and dressed and looked much like the other Egyptians. It isn't surprising to me that Joseph's brothers did not recognize him when they saw him. On seeing him, they bowed to him, which was actually a fulfillment of the dream Joseph had before. Joseph used the fact that they did not recognize him to his advantage and then began to question them if they were spies. He was able to find out that his father and younger brother Benjamin were still alive. Joseph's brother Simeon was kept in Egypt while the other brothers returned home with grain. He told them not to come back without Benjamin, or no, no, do not come at all. Then Joseph organized the servants to plant the silver that the brothers had paid for the grain in the, in the sacks. When they discovered it on their journey home, the brothers assumed they would be guilty of theft even though they did not put it in there. On their return, Israel, their father, was devastated that Simeon was now also lost. As time went by, the famine became worse. Israel knew that he would have to send his sons, including Benjamin, to Egypt to get more grain. He sent them with extra gifts and more silver, hoping to appease the man in charge. Joseph's behavior had his brothers totally confused. One moment, he appeared to be angry, and the next, he was inviting them home for dinner. All of this was Joseph's way to find out more information and testing them to see if they had changed in any way from the brothers that sold them years ago into slavery. Again, Joseph had the silver planted in their bags as they left. But he put his favorite silver cup in Benjamin, the youngest, back. Knowing that Benj Benjamin could be enslaved or killed for this, Judah offered his own life in place of Benjamin. We see in chapter 45 of Genesis, Joseph saw his brother's evidence that God had worked their hearts to bring repentance. He could no longer keep up with the charade. He then revealed himself with much weeping. When Joseph revealed who he was, the brothers must have been terrified. They had once sold their young brother into slavery, and now they had power over life and death for all of them. But did Joseph hold a grudge when he paid them back? Human nature would have prodded Joseph to get even with his brothers, but his attitude was one of godly humility and understanding. In the fulfillment of the dreams of his youth, Joseph knew God was using him to save his family. He even said this to his brothers. This is Genesis 45, verses 7 and 8. Genesis 45, 7 and 8. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives in a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. My next point. He has promised victory over death. When someone we know love, that we love dies, it can feel like a major sting that strikes, like a jolt of lightning. Someone we care about is suddenly gone. The reality of their absence can leave a deep, penetrating, and stinging void, especially to those that are close to them. We all have that one or possibly more people in our lives that we say to ourselves, we will never be able to survive without them. And when they die, we feel that we too have died. To me, that person was my grandmother. She was my most favorite person in the world, and I loved her very much. 
my wife likes to tease that she only married me to be part of my grandmother's family. Let us turn to chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians. And we'll read verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. My grandmother had diabetes for more than 50 years and had two bouts of cancer and liver problems. Even with all those maladies, she was full of life and had a hint of cantankerousness. She was a little mean. But it made her fun to be around. She sometimes had a mean streak, but I always was immune. I was her favorite. I would spend many hours on the telephone with her and was grateful to be there when she passed away. I, along with several other family members, surrounded her, gently caressing her hair and praying. She loved the 23rd Psalm and we recited it with her for a few times. This last bout of illness had been so very painful for her, it felt like we were helpless to do anything for her. Before she died, I told her, Grandmother, I will see you one day again, fully restored. She, being Catholic, could not understand how that could be since I was not Catholic and I would not go to heaven. She, however, loved me very much and I loved her and she just smiled. When she died, I cried and cried. I still get very teary-eyed when I think about her. She was the best of our family. So as I said, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Verse 20. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, but man also came the resurrection of the dead. That was big M, man, meaning Jesus Christ. For as in Adam we all die, even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. Verse 23. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, and when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule, and all authority, and all power. Verse 25. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he will put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under his feet under him is accepted. Verse 28. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him, who will put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now let's drop down to verse 50. <clears throat> verse 50. The same chapter. Chapter 15, verse 15. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put in incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass, saying that it is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God that who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What a joyous day it will be when I can look death in the face 
metaphorically of course, and say, where is your sting? Where is your victory? And to this day, hold my grandmother's hand. Her fully restored and perfect hand. I say thank you God, Lord God, for your promise of ending death's grip on us. One more verse in this subject here. Turn to Isaiah 25, verse 8. These words have such comfort for whatever it was that we face. Isaiah 25, verse 8. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of His people He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Wow! Can you think of anything better than that? No more tears. No more death. No more pain. No more sorrow. God has yet one more promise to us that we keep His commandments and His statutes. Remember that these laws are not a burden, but a necessity. Our next point. God wants to make sure that we, in order to get His last promise, have our hearts and minds set to live His way. Excuse me. The point actually is, <laughs> He has promised that we will become a part of the family of God. That is the last point. I'm sorry. But He has promised that we will become a part of the family of God. The church has written a lot of information on this final point why God created us in the first place. I think you all need to, if you haven't already, read the booklet, Why Were You Born? I believe I saw it back there. Please turn with me to Romans 8, verse 12 through 17. We should all understand that if we don't repent and be baptized with water, we cannot have sonship. We get God's Holy Spirit through baptism, and with that, we can understand better what God has shown us through His Scriptures. The Holy Spirit helps pull the scales off of our eyes so we can better understand. Romans 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Verse 14. For as many of us, excuse me, for as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our Spirit, and as I said before, it should be the Spirit itself, bears witness within our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may be glorified together. So yes, we do need to be baptized to be part of this family of God. But did you just happen to find out about God's glorious plan? Not really. God chose you. Let's drop down to verse 28. Excuse me, let's drop up. Wait, okay, here we go. Romans 8, verse 28, there you go. And we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Think about that when you're feeling low and pitiful about life and its challenges. As you're working to get rid of the old man and become a pure and undefiled, as humanly as you can. Without God's grace, we could never meet the example left to us by God, by Christ. But this 
you should know. Every one of you are important to God. He knew you before you were born and chose you to be part of His glorious family. You have been chosen to be joint heirs in God's family. If that doesn't make you happy, I don't know what can. Please turn with me to Hebrews 1. <clears throat> Hebrews 1. Jesus Christ, our elder brother, has shown us the way by not only giving us a more in-depth look into the commandments and statutes, but he also paved the way for us. So let's start in verse 1, Hebrews 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in the times past to the fathers by the prophets, had, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, who he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he has himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, and he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Romans 8.17 says we are to be joint heirs with Christ. In Hebrews 1 verse 2, we just read that Christ has been appointed heir of all things. The passage goes on to describe his glory and majesty, how he himself purged us from our sins. Let's look at Matthew 5. God wants His children to develop His holy and righteous character, the pattern of life ingrained through habit and choosing the right way, the way of love, and even against temptation and self-desire. We have to do our best in these physical, temporary human bodies to develop godly, righteous character, to become like our dad, our daddy, our father, Abba, and our brother, Jesus Christ. In all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we think. So let's read Matthew 5, also known as Beatitudes. I'm going to start in verse 2. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Matthew 5, verse 2. Excuse me, this is now verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall turn mercy, obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness name, like Joseph. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rest assured there is no way God will imbue us with his omnipotent power and immortality unless we are thoroughly yielded to his direction, walking humbly in his way of love and service to others as mentioned in the sermon yesterday and the sermon at this morning. Thankfully, God helps us to grow in His way throughout our lives as we learn to submit to Him. And when we are fully transformed into His likeness at the resurrection, we will have His perfect loving character as our own. No part will be left of human selfish nature. Only total selfless love and care for others just as God has, as we saw in the Beatitudes. Thus, there will be perfect harmony among all of those in God's family. And with total concern for the good of the governed, God's family will reign over the angels and all the humans that have not been changed. 
The Bible has shown us why God is mindful of mankind. He has planned for us an astounding future. We have seen that our ultimate destiny, the purpose of our existence, is to become the divine children of God, who is our Father. He wants to share with his, us His very life with us, desiring that we ultimately inherit not only all that He has, all that, but even what He is. Could anything be greater than that? What could anyone possibly wish for? The Ten Commandments are the roadmap God has given us with the promises below for following His directions. I had actually intended to wear my Ten Commandments tie, but I wore that the first day. The Ten Commandments are the roadmap that has given us all the promises as long as we follow His directions. God knew us before we were ever thought about. From the very beginning. What a genius. What wisdom is to think so far ahead that God has for us. We read earlier in Jeremiah 17 about the blessings and cursings that we would receive, but we did not follow these laws. I'd like to suggest that you read and reread Proverbs regularly for more instruction and dealing with day-to-day -day life and what is proper for us as God's child. So in summary, here are the five points that I've given you all to think about. Number one, God has promised us to supply everything that we need. God has promised us to supply everything that we need. Number two, God has promised us that His children will not be overtaken with temptation. Instead, He assures us that a way of escape will be provided. God has promised us that His children will not be overtaken with temptation. Instead, He assures us that a way of escape will be provided. Number three. God has promised us that all things will work together for good to those who love and serve Him faithfully. God has promised us that all things will work together for good to those who love and serve Him faithfully. Number four, God has promised us victory over death. God has promised us victory over death. And number five, God has promised us to become part of the family of God. God has promised us to become part of the family of God. Are we difficult children that think that we know everything? Do we or did we think that we didn't need God to tell us how to do anything? God has given us the best help and advice to help set us straight on that narrow path, our Bible. God, much like my dad, has given us instructions, advice, and even mild coercion to help us grow into productive heirs in God's family. Let us strive to not be like a wayward child, bent on doing things our own way, like I was, and be mature enough to be able to receive His instructions and correction. I hope by now, as we work on becoming mature Christians, that we can plainly see and understand the wisdom of Dad, our Father in heaven.